Netflix program here at the hospital. Um, just a reminder, I'm sure you've all done it, but if you have one of these, you might want to uh, turn off the buzzer, the ringer, the... Uh, for one, I have actually a, a Red Wing Blackbird song in here, so when it rings, people think, oh, there's a bird in the room, and, and I avoid the embarrassment of whose phone is that? Anyway, thank you again for coming. Uh, we have the pleasure of hearing from a colleague of mine, Dr. Jeff Bishop. Um, he comes to us from St. Louis University, and you know, when you're doing one of these introductions, you typically go to a website to find out who is this person, and what nice things can I say about him. And what I found most interesting, if you actually take the time to Google this guy and go to his website. Uh, read the description there and it says, Dr. Bishop is a social and moral philosopher teaching medical ethics and philosophy at St. Louis University. And then, then it adds a sentence, he is also a physician, which I think is quite interesting because often uh, that would be the first thing they say about somebody, but clearly the identity of my colleague here is more in the realm of social and moral philosophy. Oh, and by the way, he's also a physician. Um, he's done work, actually this is also an interesting fact, when you invite a friend you find out these things. His bachelor's degree is in zoology. Uh, I would not have predicted that. Um, and he has a PhD in philosophy, oh yeah, and he has an MD degree as well. Um, and right now he's holding the Tenet Endowed Chair in Healthcare Ethics and he directs the Albert Ganegi Center for Healthcare Ethics. And he's going to talk to us this morning, this afternoon, this lunchtime about uh, a good practitioner. So uh, Jeff, welcome. We're so delighted that you're here. Thanks, thanks Ray, and uh, thanks to Christian and uh, Andrew for inviting me as well uh, to, be a, to be here with you. Um, I, t I changed the title. It, it was probably advertised as the good physician, and as I, as I thought about it, I was invited to give a talk titled The Good Physician at Cedar sinai Hospital earlier, and it, they wanted it to be about medicine, and so I focused on that. But the, what I had to say applies to any practitioner, so I decided to modify the talk a little bit uh, and, and, to, and to speak more about just practitioners in healthcare. Um, it's, this is a, I, 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 I like hot button issues in medical ethics, but a lot of times that kind of drives our thinking. Uh, it, kind of, uh, it kind of skews our thinking as well, where everything is always a, a problem that we have to address. And this is one where I'm trying to kind of step back from that issue-driven, uh, you know, trying to solve a problem that arises and just thinking a little bit more systemically and systematically about some things that I think are affecting practice that are related to both our social and political philosophy in the United States, but also social and political pressures within in medicine itself. So uh, I'm going to step back. It's not going to be a hot button sort of uh, uh, talk. Uh, we're going to look a little bit more systematically uh, subtle issues in the ethics of healthcare. Um, this is, of course, a picture of William Osler, uh, who is, you know, sought, thought to be a paragon of, 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 of the relationship between medicine and sort of philosophy, or the, the sometimes we refer to it as the spiritual or the softer side of, of medicine and healthcare. Um, I'm not going to say anything else about him uh, at, the, at this point. Now, my wife is an English teacher, and she often corrects the grammar used by the family. So if someone says, or if someone asks my children, how are you? They know that they have to answer, I am well. Because if the answer, I am good, comes out of their mouth, their mother is going to be on top of them. She, they weren't asking about your moral character, they're asking how you're doing, right? Well, it's an adverb. Good is an adjective. Well modifies a verb, and good a noun. When someone asks how you are doing, they are asking how you are feeling, how are you getting along. They're probably not asking about your moral character, about your identity, right? So when we say, Anne is a good physician, when we say, she is a good physician, or he is a good nurse, we are saying something a bit deeper than what she does. We are saying something about who she is. So in the case of a physician, we of course um, want good physicians. We expect her to be certainly knowledgeable about physiology and pathology and pharmacology and knows how and when to access the latest evidence and practice guidelines. And sure, we think that the, when she practices um, uh, within these legitimate boundaries of law and ethics, that she's also being good in that way as well, right? 
But we've started thinking about goodness primarily on the side of the technical expertise. But by saying that she is a good physician based on these criteria is like saying she's a good mechanic. We tend to mean something a bit different by saying she is a good mechanic than when we say she is a good physician. We tend to mean that, oh, he's a good mechanic, they're good at their job. But when we say she is a good physician, it seems we, are, we mean something a little bit different than that. We tend to also mean that she is kind, compassionate, capable of really listening, capable of communicating the facts, certainly, but also capable of putting an interpretive frame on, that fact, on those facts and able to put those interp that interpretive frame into action in some way. And she seems not to know not only what to do when technically doing it, right, but she is capable of doing it with the right kind of humanity, with the right kind of flair, right? So when we say she's doing, she is a good physician, we are saying something about her character. And if you found out that your good mechanic was convicted of animal cruelty, you would think nothing of it. You probably could still go that mechanic, right? But if you found out your physician was convicted of animal cruelty, you might pause before you go see that physician again. Because we tend to mean something a little bit deeper. So. Now, I do not pretend to be a good physician, right? Uh, I don't practice anymore. It's been five years since I've even had a chance at being a good physician, right? But I did want to share with you a story from my early career that I've been thinking about all these years later in relation to some things that have happened recently in the United States. So this is in 1998. I was a young general internist, and I'd been out of residency for about two years and was establishing a panel of patients. And one afternoon, I'd been trudging along seeing patients when I saw a new patient arrive. I had about 45 minutes set aside for new patients, and I'll call this guy Jim. And Jim and I hit it off. Uh, Jim was an emeritus professor of economics at a local university, and I was always interested in philosophy and politics and political economy. And after, before long, Jim and I were talking about philosophy of economics and political economy and economic theory and micro and macroeconomics and homo economicus, right? It was a major geek fest. But we hit it off. And before long, an hour and 15 minutes had passed. And the nurses were getting antsy. And thankfully, I only had one other patient after Professor Jim. Jim was 72 years old. And he was mostly healthy. He had some hypertension and some benign parasitic hypertrophy, but nothing major going on health-wise. We developed a plan for his hypertension management, talked about some exercise and other lifestyle improvements he wanted to make. We planned for our next appointment, and I got up, shook his hand, and turned to head out the door when he stopped me. Dr. Bishop, I have something else I want to talk to you about. In fact, it's the main reason that I'm here. You see, he said, I belong to the Hemlock Society. And while I am doing very well right now, I can foresee a time when I might want to take my own life. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to suffer the indignity of an incapacitated life. Um, and I'm searching for a doctor who can write the prescriptions for the medications suggested by the society when that time comes for me. In fact, that's the only reason I'm here today. And in fact, that's why he left his previous doctor. His previous doctor wouldn't do that. I'm looking for a doc, he said, who's willing to help me out when that time comes. Will you help me? Needless to say, I was taken aback a bit. It's always the, the oh yeah, one more thing, doc. That's everybody who's a physician, and, uh, or even nurses, I mean, right? It's, oh, one more thing. You know, it's that last thing that kind of wallops you. So I was taken aback. And I need to tell you a little bit more about myself in order for you to understand better why I was taken aback. I am a Christian. Now, I'm not one of those fundamentalist types that thumps on the Bible and interprets it according to my own idiosyncratic interpretations. I love science. 
I use technology all the time. I accept evolutionary theory. I have a PhD in philosophy. And I can defend my moral positions uh, that I hold on many different levels. In fact, uh, in fact that medicine uh, might present moral dilemmas to me was clear to me from the get-go when I started, right? I did extremely well in obstetrics and gynecology as a medical student. N numerous residents, chief residents, attendings, um, even the chair of the department all tried to convince me to go into OB-GYN as a specialty. And while I really liked OB-GYN, I knew there was a chance that I might be asked to do something that, I would, that would go against my conscience, right? I could not and would not be able to participate in what I consider to be a moral tragedy namely abortion. So I decided that I would not go into OB-GYN because I did not want to be in a position where I might be forced to deprive someone of something that she considered necessary health care that I personally found to be problematic. So I became an internist to avoid such messy things because you really don't get into those kind of things in internal medicine so much, or so I thought. Now, there are those out there who believe that abortion, because abortion is legal and it's an accepted part of medical practice, that physicians should be required to write prescriptions for the medications that will induce abortion. Their argument goes something like this. One ought to be required, even against his or her conscience, to give the medications that might induce an abortion, or a nurse ought to be forced to participate in an abortion if she happens to be on duty, or he happens to be on duty. Nurses and doctors hold public trust as licensed practitioners uh, by the state to provide legal medical services. These things are legal, and therefore you should be required to carry them out. Now I call this the technocratic position. I'll explain that a little bit later. Now, at the time of Jim's asking this of me, there was only one state in the union that permitted physician-assisted suicide, and it was still going through a vote at that time. There are now five states, and California is the most recent one, and its, its law goes in online uh, in, in just a uh, few months, in June, in fact. So numerous other states are considering such proposals. So needless to say, Jim has come back to the forefront of my mind. Now, this is not a talk about physician-assisted suicide. Rather, it is a talk about the nature of medical practice today and how we get hemmed in by what I'm going to call technocratic thinking. So according to this technocratic position, one uh, 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 this position on conscience, there are two correct responses. The first response is this. Yes, Jim, if, I, uh, if you have a terminal condition and it is your wish to kill yourself in order to achieve your notion of the good death, then I will help you out. If you don't think physician-assisted suicide is morally legitimate, even if legal, then there is a second correct response. And it goes something like this. Well, Professor Jim, I have to warn you that I am not going to be able to do that. I have a moral compulsion against killing people or participating in killing them, even though in the state where we happen to be, it might be legal. Therefore, I cannot in good conscience give the medication to you. In fact, since this is what you want, I can no longer be your doctor. Now, in what follows, I'm going to describe for you why these two responses are the correct responses, the only two responses that seem to be possible in a kind of technocratic medicine, okay? And along the way, I'm going to claim that this framing of medical practice is too restrictive. So today I want to ask a question that to the modern ear sounds a little suspect, even sacrilegious. Is there a difference between an effective physician, the physician who does well at her job, and the good physician? Now, you'll have to bear with me, for I have two problems. One, I'm a philosopher. Anytime a philosopher gives a talk, we like to make an argument to give reasons for our positions. We talk about esoteric stuff sometimes, and so I'll do a little bit of that, and I'll try not to make it too esoteric. Uh, this problem will be heightened by another problem that I have. Uh, 
Um, and that is the fact that as practitioners of medicine, you like empirical evidence. You don't like arguments. You like empirical evidence. And philosophers, we appeal to a different kind of evidence, okay? We appeal to moral argumentation. That's slightly different. And Aristotle noted 2,500 years ago that moral science is not like natural science. Our moral philosophy is not like natural philosophy, is more like what Aristotle would have said, which can give us some degree of certainty, right? Science can give us certainty, but moral knowledge is more like anthropology or worse, poetry, than it is like mathematics, okay? So I'll be asking you to bear with me as I try to develop a philosophical argument. Now, my second problem is a personal problem, and it's probably gonna require more forgiveness on your part, more tolerance on your part. You see, I'm a Texan by, ethnicity by birth, right? And we just like to argue, right? So I'm gonna make arguments and I like to argue, so I'm gonna to try to do something here that may sound a little odd to you. So let's see what happens. So I'm going to make an argument that we live in a time where we, the cultural elite, assuming you let a Texan amongst you, right? We, the cultural elite, like to think we are morally neutral, that we are technocrats, efficiently engaged in bringing about the goals of medicine. We are like cogs in the wheel of a healthcare delivery system. Yes, yet I'm going to make an argument that the practitioner, whether nurse, doctor, social worker, whatever, along with her patients, they're actually part of a quest that is moral through and through, and not at all morally neutral. That quest is to help the patient to discover the good and what the good life entails. The good physician, I'm going to argue, is not the morally neutral, efficient physician. In fact, I shall argue that medicine is as much a moral endeavor as it is a scientific or technological endeavor. And I'm sure many of you are already skeptical, so let's just get started. So, I think the first example of this shift towards the good physician becoming more a technocrat, right? The one who knows physiology, who knows all the different aspects, can be found in the way that our language has shifted. We stopped talking about the goods of medicine or the good of medicine and started talking about the goals of medicine. Goals are imminent. Goals are easily articulated. Goals of care are concrete. So today we are going to get you sitting up for 20 minutes, right? By next week, we want you to decrease your weight by a pound, right? By the time of your next visit, we want your diabetes to be under better control. Goals are the kinds of things that allow us to produce practice guidelines. They produce the standards of care to which we all adhere. Goals are concrete, goals are measurable, goals are tangible, but ultimately goals are instrumental and for all patients, unless the goals are aimed at some good, the goals are extremely difficult to execute, right? They have to want it for a good reason, right? They don't just want the blood to go around and round more efficiently, right? They want to be able to play with their grandchildren, right? It's always aimed at some good and not just a goal. So I want to lose five pounds, but unless I think it is good to lose five pounds, it is difficult to pull it off. Is the good physician or the good nurse merely the goal-directed physician and the goal-directed nurse? It seems to me that the good physician or the good nurse is something different than the goal-directed nurse or physician. Now don't get me wrong here. We certainly need our goals, but when we, but when we do, uh, but when do we ever ask ourselves, what are the goods of medicine? What are the goods of care? What is the good that is achievable in my dying, even in my dying, right? What is the good nurse? What is the good physician? So it seems to me that today we sit right at the edge of a precipice. We seem to want to believe that the technical aspects of medicine are what really matters and not the moral aspects of medicine. We like to speak of the goals of medicine, but not necessarily the goods of medicine. We seem increasingly to think a good physician is the one who follows the rule book 
She follows the practice guidelines in each situation. She simply carries out her role in the way a mechanic might. Now, one of the most prolific philosophers of medicine was the physician Ed Pellegrino, who died just, a, I think, in 2013, just a few years ago, at the age of 92. He had a long career. And Ed wrote the following statement, a theory of good grounds every theory of morals, general or medical. Now, in order to get a theory of the good, I want you to think back to your philosophy 101 course as an undergrad, okay? Now, you probably recognize this painting. It's, uh, it's in the Vatican Museums. It's right before you get into the Sistine Chapel. And this is Michelangelo's painting of uh, the Academy. And this, this is, uh, do you know who these guys are, the guy pointing? Who's the guy pointing? Plato. Why is it, why is it Plato? He's pointing at the world of the forms. The forms, the ideals, that's right, the ideas, the realm of the ideas. And then who's this guy? Aristotle. Aristotle, right? He's talking about the eminent realm, because Aristotle was like, no, no, it has to be instantiated. It's not, it's not just ideal, it's, it has to be instantiated in the stuff of the world, right? Um, so this is a very, very famous painting, right? So, uh, Plato and Aristotle, you will remember, talked about virtues. And you'll remember that they held that the, there are intellectual virtues, right, on the one hand, and moral virtues on the other. The moral virtues included things like courage and temperance and justice and prudence. And the intellectual virtues included knowledge, what we might call scientia, science, right? It's the Latin word for it which is really just careful observation. Another intellectual virtue was understanding, right? To take those observations and to put them together into a kind of a whole vision of how the world works. So there's understanding. And then the third is itself wisdom. And wisdom was the virtue that not only knew the facts and knew how those facts cohered, understood how those facts cohered, but also what ought to be done with those facts, how to bring the good into existence in the world. Now, wisdom gave birth to the virtue of prudence. Let me go back. Wisdom gave birth to the virtue of prudence. So prudence was an intellectual virtue. It was thought to be something you did with your mind, but it also kind of brought, was brought, brought to bear on the moral virtues, how to balance those virtues out, right? How to figure out what was courageous, what was temperate, what was just, right? So it was an intellectual virtue that brought, was brought to bear upon our thinking. So wisdom gave birth to the virtue of prudence, which is an intellectual virtue aimed at moral virtue, aimed at acting wisely on those understood facts to bring them about in reality, to bring the good about in reality. Wisdom ought to know and understand the good. Prudence sought to enact the good. Wisdom or contemplation is a different thing than was knowledge, scientia, science, okay? Let me just catch back up here. So understanding was how they, uh, uh, the facts cohered together. Wisdom was how they cohered in, in the ought, in the way that it ought to be. So for both Plato and Aristotle, the nature of the good was a metaphysical, and dare I say it, a spiritual quest. And more importantly, it was not a lonely spiritual quest. That picture of Plato and Aristotle, they're surrounded by other people. And in fact, Plato and Aristotle frequently said, Philosophy is best done amongst friends. And I, I, I was just saying to some of the guys that, that the best philosophizing, it doesn't happen in philosophy departments, I'm sorry, I hope there, I have to hope there are some philosophy professors in here. But it doesn't happen in philosophy departments, it happens at pubs, at our coffee shops, right? It's where you really sit around and you really talk about things that are important, right? It's a spiritual quest, best done amongst friends. So the quest for the good required friendship, right? It required companions along the way, right? So the quest for the good required friends to help one along the way. We don't know, or, we don't know how to discover the good 
in the same way that we might study a rock or to study or to study or discover a genetic function, right? The good isn't something you just find sitting there that you happen upon in nature, right? So the quest for the good is a dialectical, conversational exploration about the meaning of life. We need contemplative conversation with friends, according to Aristotle and Plato. In fact, in books 8 and 9, Aristotle, in the Nicomachean Ethics, has this long treatise on friendship as a necessary to achieve goodness. So it's not just that the friendship itself was instrumental to figure out what the good was, but it was constitutive of the good. Okay? The best of friends are the friends who want what's good for you. And the quest for the good, the possibility of achieving the good, the possibility of being wise and not just rational and not just knowledgeable requires friendship. Philosophy is best done amongst friends and preferably over wine. So there's a lot more that could be said about the history of moral philosophy. But for our purposes, I'm going to jump about 12 centuries into the future from Plato and Aristotle. And I'm going to jump to the 17th and the 18th centuries. And our way of thinking about ethics today flows more out of what happened in the early modern period than in the ancient period. So science is born in the early modern period, even though it was not called science until about the 20th century. It was called natural philosophy up to that point. Science, or rather natural philosophy, shaped our understanding of ethics today, and we have forgotten how the ancients thought about it. Since ethics began to be shaped by science, let me give you a brief history of the rise of science. Sorry to geek you out. So on the one hand, there were those thinkers like Rene Descartes who thought that our knowledge was grounded in rationality, in reasoning, or understanding through the use of geometry, mathematics, and logic. He was the one who said, I can be deceived by my sense experience, and the only thing I can trust is that I'm thinking, that it is I am who, who am deceived, right? If I'm being deceived about the realities of the world, the only thing I can be sure of is that it's me, I, right? He's the one who said, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. He trusted logic and mathematics, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? I think, therefore I exist. The science or knowledge for Descartes is grounded in our capacity to reason. Knowledge is grounded in our logic and in reason. And Descartes and his group were called the rationalists. However, another group of thinkers from the early modern period held a competitor view of what science is or what natural philosophy is all about. This group is called the empiricists. And they ask the question, what does the real world of things have to do with mathematics, right? Why would we think that what's going on between the ears matches up equally with what's going on in the world, right? So which do we trust, the thinking between our ears or getting our hands on the things, the empirical facts of the world, right? So on one hand, there were those thinkers like Rene Descartes who thought our knowledge was grounded in rationality, in reasoning, and understanding, right? And on the other hand, we have the empiricists. And this group of empiricists uh, struggled to, against the rationalists to try, no, science is grounded in observation, right? And to this day, these two groups, these warring camps, the rationalists on the one hand and the empiricists on the other, have forged a relationship together that we call science today. Modern science is rational and skeptical empiricism or skeptical and empirical rationalism, okay? It's going back and forth between our, the way our theories work, testing those theories with reality, and then going back and changing our theory. We're constantly moving back and forth between observations, empirical stuff, and then thinking about that empirical stuff, putting it together in models and, and, and realms, uh, models and, and, and mathematical theories, right? So these two groups of national, natural philosophers, the rationalists and the empiricists, would work things out in the long run, okay? And they created modern science that we, that, as we understand it today. 
But this way of thinking, this early modern science, right, elevated knowledge and reasoning over this other thing that the ancients talked about called wisdom, right? So the early modern philosophers elevated knowledge over wisdom. In fact, many of them believed that if, uh, that if you didn't have empirical evidence of the good, then perhaps there is no such thing as the good. And all we could really talk about is what's doing what's right, not what's good. So many of them thought that one could not scientifically know the good. Because what does the good look like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? You can't really get your hands on it. Thus, these thinkers, as scientists, did not think we could talk about the good or about wisdom because it resisted empirical knowing and rational discourse, mathematical logic. Thus, the early modern thinkers stopped talking about wisdom and focused everything on science, knowledge. They stopped talking about the good in the process. Now, while many empiricists didn't think we could speak scientifically about the good, they still thought we could talk about morality. David Hume said, we can only know the world through our senses, and the only way to know the right thing to do is if we pay attention to the things we call good and the things that we call bad. The things we call good are things that are pleasurable to our senses, and the things that we call bad are painful. Thus, for the empiricist, morality is based on sense experience of pleasure and pain. We don't know what is good per se, but we do know those things that cause pleasure and those things that cause pain. And thus, the utilitarians were born. We call the good things those things that are pleasurable. We call the bad things the bad, uh, as those things that are, are uh, painful. And Jeremy Bentham attempted to do science with this. So he tried to think of all the possible pleasurable experiences one could have and assign them a mathematical value. And all, the, all of the uh, bad, painful experiences, right? And to assign them a negative mathematical value. And then the way you knew what to do was the way to act rightly, the right thing to do is to add up the pleasure units against the negative pleasure units. And you know, you get more pleasure units out of doing this than you go with that over some other option. Okay, They really thought that they would de define morality that way, scientifically, right? Based on empirical experience. All right. So just as some of the empiricists still believed we could, do, uh, we could think about morality, even if we don't have access to the good, some rationalist philosophers like Immanuel Kant and other deontologists thought we could work out the right way to do things, even if we didn't know what the good was. Right? You don't, can't discover the good. It's not like it's, what color is it? Is it pink? Is it blue? You know, what's it look like? What's it taste like? What's it smell like? You can't get your hands on it. But maybe we can talk about the right way to act rather than the good way to act, according to Kant. So Kant believed that by abstracting from all of the heteronymous laws in the world, right, by abstracting from what the church taught or what your culture taught you, you could still figure out the right thing to do, right? You are moral, according to Kant, not by following the law or doing what the church tells you to do or following your own self-interest or doing what is pleasurable for you, yourself or others. You are, are morally, you're only morally praiseworthy if you let this categorical imperative, this kind of like the axioms of geometry, right? This categorical imperative dictate to you what the right thing to do is. So if you did something and you benefited from it, according to Kant, it wasn't moral. It was amoral. If you did something uh, out of the, if it was in your best interest or in the patient's best interest, it was going to produce more good for the patient, well, that would be moral. That would be amoral. You have to follow the dictates of the geometry, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And that geometry was called the categorical imperative, right? These were the dictates, the axioms of morality. And the categorical imperative, he argued, can be followed when you act in such a way that your action could become a universal law, right? So it's true for you and you and you and you and you and you and you. That's the only way I can act that way, okay? Second, 
He said, when you act in such a way that you treat persons as ends and never merely as means. That word merely is really interesting. That's actually how he puts it. It's merely as means. You still use people as means, but just not merely as means. You have to take their ends, their purposes into consideration. Okay? And also the third version of the categorical imperative says something to the effect of you act morally when you act as your own sovereign in the kingdom of ends. When you're primarily focusing on the ends of, of, of your life, but when you're autonomously choosing it, when you don't have somebody else telling you what to do, like the law, right? It's not morally praiseworthy according to Kant. If the law tells you to do it, you do it because it's, it's, it's legal, right? Or you don't do it because it's illegal. It's only morally praiseworthy if you do it abstracting from that and dealing with the axioms of geometry, this universalized account of morality, okay? So, we're going to jump a couple more centuries to our own time, and we are well on our way to Beecham and Childress, probably the most influential thinkers in bioethics today. And if you studied medical ethics after about 1980, you will remember the four principles. Two of those principles are born out of the empiricist tradition of thinking, don't do harm, don't cause pain, right? Non-maleficence. Do good, cause pleasure, right? Those come out of the empirical arm of, of uh, the science of, of morality. And then two rationalist principles kind of act as the boundary for these two empirical principles. Respect persons, autonomy. You know, you're an autonomous agent. You're, you have some integrity, right? Never use someone merely as a means, but always as an end, right? And justice. Deploy an ideal of what the world should be like, right? So those two principles come out of the rationalist tradition. The two empirical uh, uh, principles are non-maleficence and beneficence, okay? So science and reasoning, knowledge and understanding were the principles that, uh, are the, the virtues that operated in the tradition of the, of the ancients. But they had this other dimension of wisdom that was dropped out, right? And all we spend our time talking about in medicine is knowledge and understanding, but not about the moral ought, right? Not about wisdom. So with these two, with the, with the, with we should mature with just principles, we are trying to figure out the moral calculus, right? Subtracting the pain from the pleasure, bounded by respect for autonomy and justice, and then we know the right thing to do. But notice something, we are not talking about the good anymore. We are not talking about wisdom. We are not talking about contemplation. We are talking only about two of Aristotle's and Plato's intellectual virtues, science, sciencia, knowledge, right? And understanding or reasoning. And that's what we spent our time talking about. So we are focused on the rational thinking about what is right, and we are thinking about our perceptions of what is pleasurable and painful, and we are focused on knowledge and reasoning, science and understanding, but we are not thinking about the good, about wisdom, which was Plato and Aristotle's highest amongst the intellectual virtues. Thus, moral philosophy, which had been speculative and dialectical and required us to sit around and talk about the nature of the good life with friends, gave way to a scientific way of thinking, something that could be universalized across to everyone in this room and not particularized for you. Okay. So thus, I argue that it is about this thinned out version of ethics, the focus of the science of ethics, the rules of ethics as articulated by the early modern thinkers and by Beecham and Childress, that is what results in the contemporary scene, not the cultivation of wisdom and not the cultivation of prudence, but in the focus on our policies and our procedures rather than upon judgment. It results in language about rights and the goals of care rather than language about the goods of care. Thus, we have policies for everything. The policies police us and guide our actions. There is little room for judgment and prudence because judgment and prudence might mean that we act outside of policy 
without the blessing of the policy, without some rule, it is also thins out our language about the good. Thus, we are left with this kind of technocratic set of procedures and policies meant to do what is right, what follows the rule, what follows the policy, with no way of speaking together with patients about the good, the good for this particular person, the good that medical care might or might not enable, the goods as understood by a particular patient, the goods of medicine, and the physician's understanding of the good an understanding of the good that might uh, that that uh, that is made desirable for the physician to go into medicine to begin with. Most of us, right, we go into medicine precisely because we want to do good, not because we want to do well. So we no longer have friendships between patients and physicians and nurses. We have contracts. We now seek to be the efficient physician and forget to seek to be the good physician or the good nurse. We now follow policies aimed at goals, hoping that we might be also aiming at a good, but that seems to be an afterthought. So I imagine that if I ask those of you in this room who are, who are physicians or nurses, what is it really science that motivated you to go into healthcare? I imagine most of you would say no. It was something deeper, something that you couldn't quite get your hands on, something deep and personal. It was not a deep zeal to follow the rules or the policies that brought you into health care. It was the deep hope of doing something good. It is something less than science and more, less like science and more like poetry that called you to become a physician or a nurse or whatever it is you do as a practitioner. And I bet that if you think about it, you will say that it was something good that called you into the profession, independent of science and reasoning, right? And it is this deep thing, it is this deep thing that calls to you when you are fed up with the practice guidelines and the policies and the procedures and the goals of care. And it is this deep source of wisdom that might even call you to be disruptive to the procedures and the policies and the guidelines. And the lawyers are going, what? Right? So I want to return to Professor Jem's question to me. Will you help me when that time comes? He was asking me, will you help me to kill myself when that time comes? And now I laid out the answers that we were supposed to give. Either yes, it is legal. Physician-assisted suicide is legal, and therefore I will help you to kill yourself. Or no, even though physician-assisted suicide is legal, I cannot in good conscience help you to kill yourself. And thus, Jim, I cannot be your doctor. But I said something different to Jim that was neither of these things. I do not call myself a good physician or wise. I'm a Texan after all. And it's probably the Texan in me is telling you to break the rules and forget what the technocrats say. But I said to Jim, you know, Jim, I really like you. And I hope I get to be your doctor. But I cannot tell you that I will give you those drugs. But I can also, I, but I also cannot imagine a situation, I said, in which we will find ourselves, we're killing you where killing yourself would be the only option that we could find. I bet we could come up with some other solution for you. He paused and he thought for a moment and he thought for a long time and he said, well, doc, I like you and I guess I'll just take my chances with you. Now, I do not offer this story as a story of myself as a good physician. Rather, I offer it up because the answers that the technocratic medicine have said are, that they, they have said are the correct answers are rather restrictive to the practice of medicine, I would argue. Policies and procedures hem us in because they imagine that we physicians and nurses are rather more like mechanics, capable of acting well, but perhaps not really doing good. We are hemmed in because our time elevates our period, our time period, our historical period, elevates a relationship based on contract over relationship based on friendship. And we are hemmed in because we elevate knowledge over wisdom. We are hemmed in because we elevate science over poetry. It seems to me that the technocratic thinking of contemporary medicine hems us all in. 
So we are sort of stuck in the policies and procedures, the practice guidelines and the goals of care, the goals of medicine, and we never think about the goods of medicine. Technocratic medicine might help us to achieve goals, but much of the time it keeps us from pondering the goods of care, the goods of healthcare. So Jim and I did become friends as he came back to see me over and over over the next few years. And we talked about philosophy and politics and economics, and we talked a lot about the, it was in Dallas, Texas, we talked about the Dallas Cowboys and the Texas Rangers, we talked about the goals of care and the goods possible in life, and we talked about the goods possible as we get older and as we die. He never once asked me to kill him. I left that practice, and so I don't have a nice, tidy story, so I don't know exactly what happened at Jim's ending. I only heard from my colleague who had taken over my practice that Jim had died. And I didn't ask, because I'm not sure I really wanted to know, um, but I do not think he asked my colleague to kill him. And I like to think that Jim and I, a couple of friends, charted a path a little closer to wisdom and to goodness and avoided the morass of technocratic medicine. I'll stop there, thank you. Yeah, there you go. I was waiting. <laughs> um, so uh, I appreciate that following the law is not a good in and of itself. If you're doing that just to follow the law. But couldn't law or policy be accepted as a practical way to sure. implement the Kantian ideal for the most people? Sure. Again, as utilitarian, but bringing that in. Yeah. But because we understand that while many, if not most, physicians are good, some of them are not. So does, can policy play a role as a safety net in those circumstances? So, so what I would it's worth like giving up. Of the yeah, I, I, you know, hear hear me out. So for so for the for the uh, for even for the ancients, uh, the idea of a policy are. Uh, so this, I'm supposed to repeat the question. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a big sign here. So repeat the question. <laughs> uh, so so. Tom Aquinas said, the law is a moral educator. Right? It has a purpose beyond just following the rules. It actually shapes you. So what I would say about policies and procedures, so the informed consent, it, it's one of those things surgeons just love, right? And you have a tick box, you have a set of things, and you go, and it becomes a tick box, and it becomes that, it actually fails at its purpose. But the whole point of it is, is not necessarily just to educate the patient, because it's shaping the physician as well. Right? So it shapes the moral character of the physician such that now the informed consent process is embodied and not just a piece of paper. The problem is, is that we, the way we think about policies and procedures, they become just pieces of paper. They don't have any role in forming the identity of or the character of the person who does it. It becomes that tedious little form that I have to go and tick off. And the good thing is, is that all these surgeons, they've done it a thousand times. The piece of paper is what drives them crazy. But what's already happened to them is their moral character has been shaped by that, hopefully, so that it becomes a conversation about what are the goods possible in this and not just the policies and procedures. So the law can be a moral educator, but it, it's secondary, I would say. And for us, it's become everything, I feel. So that it's just mostly a where do we put it? I didn't say that we abandoned reasoning or knowledge, we just have to have wisdom, right? So the law is about knowledge and reasoning, we still have to have wisdom about it. Uh, and, and that means it, it shapes me to, to follow the law, right? It, it certainly does. It shapes my identity. Not, first, the law should shape my identity so that we do the good, not just so that we tick the boxes so we don't get sued. That's the technocratic hemming in. And so it, it becomes the all encompassing thing. That's what I worry about. Because we stop talking about the good. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Other thoughts? Questions? Yes, sir. You are in Michigan. Michigan says assisted suicide is illegal because of Dr. Kowalski, the graduate of high school. Um, and 
you are still in practice and you is still your patient and he says enough is enough. I'm old, I'm sick, I'm cranky. Uh, I don't want to live anymore, I have nothing to live for. Do you say to him, well, I can't help kill you because assisted suicide is illegal in Michigan, but I will give you this prescription. Don't take this medicine all at once, it'll kill you. <laughs> that, that's, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna answer that. Because I don't think I, that's the answer I'll give. So actually, and I think this is the thing. If, if Joe knows me, he probably wouldn't know that's not gonna happen, right? So we're friends, but we also know our locations, right? And so he, he begins to know me just as well. And so he probably wouldn't answer that. But if he did, and who knows? If she knows, maybe in a moment like that, he's suffering tremendously. And I might reach to the past the door. I don't know, right? Uh, I don't think so, but I, I don't know. But then again, I'm also very well attached to him, right? And so I might say, you know, this is the law. It wouldn't be for me. Somebody might be able to make a case. Well, the law would be wrong. The law is not moral. Okay? So I, I would say that this leaves open that possibility. The contingencies of, of the moral judgment. The problem is you've got to trust the guy that can And sometimes, sometimes you need to sort of input so that I just make sure you're going to cry. And that's what the law is about. So I, I personally think it ought to remain illegal. If somebody chooses to do it, or they have a compelling moral reason to do it. Right? And that scares Oxford to really protect the law, too. Um, so I, I personally, I, I think it's a bad idea. I think it will shift us culturally. It will make us to, I think the, if you look at the procedure in, in my book, I talk about that, about how the procedures in Oregon actually start to inculcate the values of proceduralism, right? So that we just reaffirm for the patient this is the rational choice. Right? Rather than actually challenge the patient about whether this is a good choice. We're worried about the rational decision of the patient. So, it's going to be messier, but I also wonder if all of us will be a little bit happier with that. Okay, I got me. Other thoughts or comments? Yes? So, I'm in crash. I, you know, I, and I'm deeply in crash. So I was like, wow. All physicians should love their patients. I'm a teacher. I really like to strive to love my students. You know, in the, in the whole on sense of that I love. But in the back of my mind, I'm also in tears. So you're going to like complain about philosophy, which is really beautifully argued, convincing. But there is this empirical world out there. And let me give you a story from that empirical world. A good friend of mine who was my primary care physician in Minnesota just was fired by the Mayo system because he loved his patients too much. They said, Mark, you've got eight minutes. Mark said, I can't do, I can't see the good of medicine in eight minutes with my patient. He refused to do it. Eventually they said, here's a cardboard box, get your things, you're out of here. And I, I don't like that, of course, because I want him to love his patients, but I could argue from the point of justice that you know, a lot of people in the healthcare, if, if Jeff is going to take 45 minutes with every patient, it's going to generate a system that's unjust. So now you have this love bouncing off justice. So how, how do you respond? Yeah, I, look, the system is corrupt. <laughs> so, so, I mean, but it's, but it's just. It's, I don't know. Is it? I mean, I, I, you get more people seen, but you know, you're just kind of turning them through, and they just get entered into the big procedural machine of the, the system. I, I don't know that I would say it's more just. I would, I would challenge that premise. But, you get more, you know, more people get the doctors, but hey, nurse practitioners are pretty darn good at primary care, you know. So maybe you, you don't need the doctor, you know. Maybe we need to think about, uh, you know, uh, other kinds of practitioners who can carry out what, what's needed. And so now we're talking about the nurse practitioner is the one who loves the patients, and we're physicians are just the technicians then. And the nurse practitioner says, here, cut here, uh, and then you, and then you're just a technician. I don't know. The surgeon's like that either, right? So, so I mean, it, it's, I, look, I would just say, look, we're, we're using the wrong scale of, of measurement here. Let's, let's rethink this. And it's precisely because I don't know what goods my patient had that I find myself wondering, where's the, where's the advanced directive form? Where's the DNR form, right? Well, you know, I didn't necessarily have the actual conversations about what this person thought was good. So maybe this, I would just say the system's corrupt. This, it's not a, there's not a fine amount of cash. We just, just choose to put it all in bonds. You know, I mean, we, we have ways of, of thinking about this. And we have to think about medicine socially and culturally. Uh, Nazi, medicine, Nazi Germany produced Nazi medicine. 
Soviet communism produced Soviet medicine. American capitalism produces American medicine. So all of the excesses of every political system shape what happens in medicine. So ours is doing that. So we have to think culturally and socially bigger. So what is the right scale of measurement? What is good medicine? What is good health? We, I, don't know, I don't know that we are capable of having that conversation anymore as a culture. That's what I'm worried about. How would you define it? I don't know. He's a philosopher. I don't know anything. No, I, I mean, how would you? I mean, I mean, think about it. I mean, it, this is actually a cultural conversation that we have to be having. And we, and we can't have it. So political system, which was born out of the same enlightenment period as the science, and uh, those are, those are actually related to the, the science. Uh, the science of the early modern period is, is intricately related to the politics of the early modern period. Uh, in fact, all of the scientists, uh, Descartes was a geometrician, but he was uh, also a political thinker. Hobbes was a geometrician. He wrote the Leviathan, the great, one of the greatest works of political philosophy. Wrong, but one of the greatest works <laughs> ever written. Uh, John Locke, physician, who thought of himself as a natural philosopher, a scientist, who we know as the author of the two treatises on government. So our, politi our politics and science are intricately related to each other, and that's always been the case. It's always going to be the case. So it is, we have to start realizing that science ain't neutral, that it, it's, it, it, it enacts a vision of the good. That's why I was saying medicine is not a scientific endeavor, it's a moral endeavor. So we have to start thinking more. But we don't have to think morally anymore. We don't have to think about moral philosophy. So that's something we have to do. So it, it's part of it. it's you. We have to have a beer. That's what yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Let me just one other variation. Just on Finger on pulse, looking at his watch. Okay. Over on the other side of the patient, I should just pull it up. Over on the other side of the patient is uh, a nursing assistant, because uh, the nursing profession begins with uh, half not severe. This woman doesn't have it. Okay. That's why the old nurses speak to her a little funny. You have to part of the habit of the mom. So, so, so she's wearing that. She's holding the child in a cup of tea. This is 1890 something. It's already captured the imagination. The doctor is distracted and abstracted from the patient, being a scientist, measuring properly with a watch, a pulse, and the nurse is over there offering care, comfort. And it's there's another fascinating thing historically: the word uh, for care and the word for cure. So you already are etymologically related in Latin. They're the same word. Curare is the same for care or cure. Okay? What it means in Latin is to care. But somehow, we take, took that word and we cut it up and put it into two different realms. The cure became the scientific thing to effect, and the care is something else. So we're already divided. It's a result of our 
heritage, uh, how do we undo it? We have to talk. I, I, I don't know either. We have to be amongst friends and we have to talk about it. Okay. It's time for us to uh, move on and give care. <laughs> Do I need to, uh, do I need to log off or something?